This was an extraordinary moment. Even after the Tunisian uprising that happened just 10 days before, no one expected these kinds of events to occur in Egypt. Egypt had been described as stable. But after what had happened in Tunisia, it gave the uprising in Egypt, even from the first night on January 25th, a sense of hope and possibility. In order to understand the uprising, you have to understand Egyptian history. None of Egypt's leaders have ever developed a compelling vision of society. They've never answered the question, what does Egypt stand for? What is its place in the world? And as a result, they've been vulnerable to political challenges and have been uh, unable to establish the loyalty of the Egyptian people and have relied almost exclusively on force to maintain control. Gamal Abdel Nasser, Egypt's strongman in the 1950s, 1960s, was really only the master of the political scene for about a decade between 1956 when he nationalized the Suez Canal and the 1967 defeat at the hands of the Israel Defense Forces in six short days. That defeat revealed the hollowness of Nasser's claims to national empowerment and even social justice and economic opportunity. Egyptians were asked to suspend political and personal freedoms in order to achieve these things. And the defeat showed that none of these things had actually been achieved. In the aftermath, with Israelis occupying the Sinai Peninsula, there was an uprising against Nasser, who had been extraordinarily popular. And what Egyptians, mostly students, were demanding was democracy. Anwar Sadat, Nasser's successor, talked about correcting the revolution. And this meant, in his words, building a state of institutions, transforming the Egyptian economy into a commercial economy, and aligning Egypt with the West, the culmination of which was Egypt's peace treaty with Israel in 1979. The problem was that all of these changes didn't bring what Sadat promised. And by at the time of his assassination in October 1981, Sadat's Egypt was more contested than ever. Egyptians just didn't buy into his vision of the future. Unlike Nasser and Sadat, Hosni Mubarak didn't even try to develop a compelling ideological vision for his 30 years in power. The coda of the late Mubarak period was stability for the sake of development. This wasn't exactly something that pulled at the heartstrings of Egyptians. And, and absent this compelling vision, Mubarak, in many ways like Nasser and Sadat, had to rely almost exclusively on force and coercion as a means of controlling the Egyptian population. Egypt's new leaders need to learn the lessons from the past. They need to develop a coherent, compelling, emotionally satisfying vision of Egyptian society and answer the question what Egypt stands for and what its place in the world is if they don't 
answer those questions in a way that makes sense to most Egyptians, they too will be forced to rely on coercion and fear to maintain their rule. This, like Mubarak before them, will be their undoing, and the struggle for Egypt will continue.